Okay, can everyone hear me? Just to make sure that... Hello. Okay, good. So, just before I start, I just want to say that I've turned the microphones off so I can't hear you guys, but if you have a question, um, just type it in the box and I'll answer it at the end of the presentation. Okay. So, just because there's so many people. So, uh, welcome to our, the Oligonucleotide Therapeutic Society's first uh, webinar designed for uh, patient representatives. And really, we're going to go over the basics of oligonucleotides as um, therapeutics um, in both uh, gene silencing and gene editing. Now, um, let me get this. Yeah, there we go. So now, as we all know, uh, probably understand that DNA has um, encodes for all the genes in our body. And these genes tend to encode these things called proteins. And these proteins do everything from um, um, hold up your cell structure to uh, uh, metabolize um, metabolize things in your body um, and they do a lot they are the workhorses of your body but um, and to make these proteins from your DNA um, there's a two-step process the first step is your DNA undergoes this transcription to RNA and this RNA undergoes a process called translation to protein now well you don't need to understand um, you don't need to remember the names of these two uh, processes you just need to know that DNA goes to this thing called RNA or messenger RNA and then uh, to the protein. Now, you can imagine this um, like if you, to imagine this in a different way, you can think of DNA like a book. Um, the DNA gets read by the RNA, which is then again read by um, the cellular machinery to make proteins, which then go on to do the um, desired jobs in the body. Now, um, when genetic diseases occur, this tends to um, be a mutation in, they occur because they're a mutation in this DNA component here. And this leads, generally leads to um, a faulty protein being produced, one that doesn't work as it is intended. Now, traditional small molecule drugs, therapeutics, tend to target this protein but for genetic diseases this does not get to the root cause of the issue the root cause of the issue is upstream in the dna so traditional molecules are not good enough to target just by just targeting the protein for genetic diseases and many proteins are termed undruggable because you can't drug them with small molecule therapeutics now this is where oligonucleotides come in and these can target either the, and I'll show you that they can target either the RNA or the DNA, as I'll show you later, um, to um, really inhibit protein production. Now, for those of you that don't know what an oligonucleotide is, at its simplest, it's just a short strand of DNA or RNA. So that's what I mean whenever I use the word oligonucleotide. It's just a short piece of DNA or RNA. Now, next pick. To understand how oligonucleotides work, I first have to um, explain to you a bit about DNA structure, and that is DNA is a double helix. It has two strands, and it's made up of these bases, A, um, A, T, G, C, as you can see here. And now what's awesome about DNA is that um, if we know the sequence of one of the strands, then we can work out the sequence of the other through these two rules. That if there's an A on one side, they put a T opposite on the other strand. And if these there is a G on one strand, you put a C on the other, on the opposite strand, and vice versa. 
So how this works in practice is I've got a little prepared is that um, if you have this sequence TCGA, then the opposite or as we call it complementary sequence will be AG because the T is the A is opposite the T and the G is opposite the C and then CT. So that is the complementary sequence and that is how we work out um, the uh, opposite sequence in the DNA structure. And you'll find that these two base pairing rules come up a lot during this talk. Now, um, actually, you'll note that for those rules to work, we need to know the sequence of one of the structure uh, the, of the first, um, the first um, strand, DNA strand. And actually, we do know the sequence of most DNA, all of the DNA and all of the RNA in the human body, thanks to the human genome product. And what this gives us is now the ability to um, make DNA or uh, RNA and specifically target um, specific regions on the DNA or RNA. And in this case, what I'm going to show you next is how we can target um, this RNA in the middle. Now. Um, RNA is very similar to its structure in DNA, except that it's, um, once the slide loads, there we go. So RNA is very similar to DNA in its structure, except that it's generally single stranded and has this u base instead of a t but they're both the same and it's still undergo you can still um make the complementary strand by using those atgc rules base pairing rules that i showed you earlier so now we can make um short oligonucleotides that can target the rna that occurs in the body and hopefully target the ones that target the faulty genes in fact uh there is a meth the method to, uh, to do this is called the antisense method. And here's a slide from Ionis Pharmaceuticals kindly provided. And on the left, you'll see that um, here's what I explained earlier. DNA makes these things called mRNA, and which normally makes a protein. But when you have a genetic disease, this mutated DNA leads to a mutated RNA, which leads to a disease causing protein. Now, this antisense drug or a short oligonucleotide that's complementary to the target RNA can bind to the mRNA and prevent um, the disease causing protein from being produced. Um, there are um, a couple of different mechanisms behind this, but um, I'm not going to go into that during my talk. But yeah, let's go. Now, based on this method, there are. Um, six um, oligonucleotides that are approved by the FDA or EMA or both, which is really good. And it's a really amazing time to be a, a part of this field. Um, and actually, if you look at the pipelines, Ionis have kindly given us their pipeline. And you can see that they could target a range of different um, diseases, even diabetes to Huntington's disease. And this is just Ionis pipeline. There are a lot of different um, companies out there that are currently working on antistense therapeutics. Now, whilst it is an amazing time to be in the field and like there's a lot of drugs being approved, there are major hurdles for antisense um, therapies. The first being that they can elicit an immune response. Um, the second is that um, small sequences of small oligonucleotides can have these things called off-target effects, which essentially means that they um, target other regions of your other parts of the RNA that it might be partially partially have a sequence complementarity to. Uh, the third is that there is poor delivery into cells. Your cells do not want to take up essentially what it seems as a um, foreign DNA to itself. So it, it's not um, easy to get DNA into cell, as easy to get 
um, oligonucleotides into cells. Um, DNA and RNA are both easily degraded inside of cells, and that um, DNA and RNA both don't don't bind to their target as well as um, they could, and they have can have poor distribution inside of the target tissue. So if you're targeting muscle or uh, brain, they cannot um, distribute as widely as you would like. Now, one way in which um, the field has been fairly successful in trying to overcome some of these issues is through chemical modifications of oligonucleotides. And for that, I have to explain a bit more about the structure of DNA. Now, don't be worried about the chemical structure on the uh, screen if you're not into chemistry as I, like as into chemistry as I am. Um, all you need to know is that this is the structure of an individual unit of DNA, and really there's three parts. There's this what we call a phosphate here. Um, let me highlight it. Draw. So it's phosphate here. There's this sugar, which is here. And you can think of this sugar as something similar to the sugar you put in your tea or coffee in the mornings. And then there's the base that I explained earlier. Now, really, all the takeaway is that there are three key parts, and all of which um, scientists can modify um, to make DNA or RNA more therapeutic relevant. And actually, the only difference between RNA and DNA is this extra hydroxyl group on the sugar, extra oxygen. Um, that gives RNA many of its properties. But again, really all to take home from this is scientists can modify all three of these um, parts of the DNA or RNA structure, and they have done quite well. Now, there are there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of um, oligonucleotide modifications out there, and I'm only highlighting a few. Um, now, what the take home really from this slide is that Anything in red is um, uh, is uh, modified from the natural DNA or RNA structure. And you can see some of these modifications either um, are subtle, such as this switching of an oxygen to a sulfur atom here, or they get to the more weird ones where you have this non-natural DNA, a non-natural structure but it does have the the basis that you would um think of dna and rna and having and there are many of these the key ones that have been um that have been placed in a that have been put into oligonucleotides as therapeutics are highlighted in the boxes uh these are these three and actually all therapeutic oligonucleotides that have been approved currently have are uh, have chemically modified um, bases in them. Uh, and it's vitally important that you do that with oligonucleotide therapeutics. Now, um, so now we talked a little bit about single-stranded oligonucleotides binding to this RNA. Uh, the question is, can, uh, can, uh, the question is, how else can we uh, um, target this RNA? And what about if you use double-stranded oligonucleotides, or specifically double-stranded RNA that can bind to the, that can um, prevent the protein from being expressed? So I wouldn't have mentioned it if there wasn't a. Uh, now, double-stranded RNA. Or they're called short um, interfering RNA, um, siRNA for short. And what occurs is if you put uh, uh, these double stranded RNA into cells, they get loaded into this risk complex that you can see here. And then one of the strands is um, cleaved off and removed. And then the remaining strand. Um, is able to target the target mRNA of choice, and the risk complex then cleaves the backbone of your mRNA, resulting in it, it can no longer express the protein of, that you want. And these are catalytic because once it cleaves the backbone of this mRNA, 
uh, the strand that's loaded into the protein, the risk complex, can um, can then um, go on to knock down other um, RNA, mRNA. Um, now, this is actually a naturally occurring process that this uh, occurs uh, in your body to silence genes on the whole. So actually, scientists are taking advantage of a naturally occurring. Now, now there is this technology is slightly newer than uh, the antisense technology, but um, our nylon have just um, have uh, recently a, an approved um, siRNA for HATTR amyloidosis back in 2018, and this was breakthrough because it's the first one of its kind. Um, here's the picture of it. Really, what you need to whilst the siRNA is in this lipid nanoparticle for formulation, we don't need to worry about that. Really what you need to take home is that there is double-stranded RNA inside of this lipid nanoparticle. So um, what is the difference between um, SI, single-stranded oligonucleotides and double-stranded RNA? Now, realistically, in terms of their hurdles, there is no difference. They still elicit an immune response like the single-stranded. There's still off-target effects, i.e. they can target other um, um, RNAs that you might not want to target. They have poor penetration into cells. They're easily degraded and distribution into the target tissue is a problem. Um, but again, to overcome this, um, Ionis, uh, our nylum, sorry, oh, I'm sorry, um, our nylum, um, use some use some di when they made their double stranded rna they used a small amount of chemical modifications to actually enhance their uh, um, therapeutic index and get um, better gene silencing that way and they even used a small amount of dna as well we don't need to worry about the exact structure but just to know that really hammer on the point that when you have oligonucleotide therapeutics um, chemical modifications are key to getting them into um, actual therapies. Now, here's the Island pipeline. And again, they have a lot in um, phase one, late stage, phase two clinical trials. Um, they're not the only company that works on um, siRNA and these types of drugs. Again, like their antisense therapies, there are a lot of them. Um, and there are many more companies that you can look for that will um, collaborate with. Now, now, this being said, um, both the antisense method and uh, using these S double-stranded RNAs, these siRNAs, um, they're both good, and they both are further upstream of the from targeting this faulty protein, but they're essentially both therapies you know you're going to have to dose patients multiple times and um, it'll be a drug for life um, and that's because the real problem is the mutation in the dna um, so how, is there a way that scientists can um, remove that mutation and correct the gene to get um, the correct protein expressed and yes is the answer to that there is this technology called uh, um, CRISPR, or Clustered Regular Interspace Palindromic Repeats. We'll stick with CRISPR. Uh, that's a big, long word. Uh, and since its um, discovery for the use of gene editing in uh, 2012, it's been a huge boom in, um, in biochemistry, molecular biology, and gene editing. In fact, there is already... Uh, the first human has been um, infused with some CRISPR, um, and they're looking at, there's a study go ongoing on whether uh, this technology can actually be effective in humans. Now, how does this technology work, and how does it allow us to um, edit a gene? Well, to put it simply, this CRISPR um, system um, essentially is like a molecular scissors. It allows um, precision cutting of this um, mutation that I've drawn here, you can see that 
one of the CRISPR system, it comes along, it cuts the DNA at a specific point, leading to these what are called double-stranded breaks. And then this allows scientists to then um, input a target gene of choice and and then you can create genes this way. Um, now, this because we work with oligonucleotides, this how this works on molecular level is through um, actually using two separate RNAs. There's one that's called the CRISPR RNA, and this is complementary to your target DNA that you want. And this finds the tar target DNA, and then there's this second RNA called uh, this tracer RNA, and this literally holds the CRISPR RNA to the, there's a Cas9 protein, and this Cas9 protein, uh, this tethers this to the Cas9 protein. Now, how this works in the set is that these two, um, CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA, form this hybrid, and the next this CRISPR, this Cas9 protein comes along and um, binds to the uh, hybrid and forms what's known as a complex. And then it's this Cas9 um, RNA complex that can go on and then cut the double-stranded DNA at specific cleavage sites. Um, now, some people have done work that has involved making what they call a single guide RNA or a single RNA. And really all this is, is they have linked the CRISPR RNA and the tracer RNA together so that you don't have to um, insert two RNAs. Now I'll get back to that in a, sec in a bit later. Um, now, again, like most technologies, um, CRISPR, uh, most new technologies, there are um, major hurdles, uh, not least that um, CRISPR itself elicits an immune response. Again, there are off-target effects, especially with a technology like CRISPR where you're gene editing. Um, you really don't want to edit a second gene. That could then lead to another different disease or expression of a different protein uh, and, and delivery. Now, before I was always talking about oligonucleotides, a single strand of oligonucleotide, a double strand of oligonucleotide, well, in this system, you now have two oligonucleotides, the CRISPR RNA and the tracer RNA to deliver, plus the Cas9 protein. And for those of you that don't know the size difference between a protein and a oligonucleotide, you can think of it like if you, if I'm an oligonucleotide and the building that I'm in is the protein, that is the size difference. And with that kind of size difference, it makes it much harder to get into cells, much more difficult. And again, you have poor distribution in tissue, and all of this um, researchers are currently trying to um, really um, solve to get CRISPR um, to work in humans and embryos, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's already been used on a variety of different diseases. Now, just because I'm a chemist, and just to also highlight the need for chemical modifications, there have been a number of papers where people have used some of the chemical modifications that I showed earlier um, in the CRISPR Cas9 system, the CRISPR Cas9 system, to try and enhance um, how well it cleaves, or how well it, um, or the to minimise off target effects and everything. Um, this is all relatively, uh, you can see all relatively new publications and it's a, a whole new field basically opened up because of this technology. Um, and it's really an, an exciting time to be a part of the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, uh, world actually. So kind of with, the, with this part of my talk, I hope I've shown you that oligonucleotides are a really important um, therapeutic class uh, therapy, whether you want to um, do some gene silencing and target the RNA 
um, to stop protein expression for a particular disease, or even if you want to um, actually edit the DNA for a disease and do some gene editing, all of which require oligonucleotides. And this is actually where the Oligonucleotide Therapeutic Society comes in. Now, if you don't know us, here's a bit about our history. That is that. It was, um, the first was, uh, they decided to come together in Tuscany, Italy, very quaint. Uh, and they decided to make the OGS Society a hub for basic and applied research for many different um, oligonucleotide therapeutic classes, um, including um, antisense, siRNA, and then what's not on here is CRISPR, but it's become added CRISPR to this list as well. And the OTS mission is um, to foster academic and industry-based research for the development of oligonucleotides. And we have a wide, a wide variety of industry and academic people come and give talks at the OTS. We see um, results from clinical trials. Um, even we have basic research talks. It's really great um, conference. I really recommend it. Now, the OTS also does um, more than just an annual conference. It does um, pre-meeting um, pre events. So actually before the annual conference, day before they'll educate newcomers on a particular topic. So like um, this year it was oligo oligonucleotide synthesis, I believe. Last year it was chemistry of oligonucleotides. Um, I'm not sure what next year is going to be. Uh, we also host webinars like this one. There's a website you can go to with um, numerous tools on there. Um, we have also a journal which we uh, that's associated with us, which is Nucleic Acid Therapeutics, which I encourage you to read. And we have a very diverse board of directors, um, many of which are in industry or academia. Um, and they're all a great bunch of people to work with and talk to about um, oligonucleotides, they, they are very passionate about them. Um, how the, the OTS Society, whilst the board of directors can focus on the um, like science side, actually we're very lucky to have um, the events innovation team. And I want to highlight these guys because um, Jerry, Alexis and Cindy all um, do all the logistics for the annual meeting and the conference. And, um, really the organizational work that goes on behind it. And without them doing that, um, we can't focus on actually providing great service for our members and the entire community as a whole. Now, this year's meeting, it just happened and actually it was um, the highest attendance um, ever for an oligonucleotide meeting, it's great. Um, the um, attendance seems to be rising now year on year. And it was, um, there was fantastic research there, fantastic um, networking went on. I had it, also a lot of fun and it's great to be part of that family. Next year is, next year's meeting, if you're interested, is actually in the, uh, is in Montreal or sunny Montreal. Uh, hopefully that, or that will be just before the snow, so it'll be nice. Um, and it might look a bit like this picture that John's put. Now. Jonathan Watts is going to be the is the scientific organizing chair, and I'm sure the um, science will be uh, amazing, and all the talks will be outstanding, and the posters will be outstanding. Now, before I go, I just want to talk about the future of the OTS Society and why we did this um, why we did this uh, webinar, and that is that. Um, we really want to include patient advocacy groups um, to our OTS mission. And we really now want to focus it. And um, what I mean by that is we want to foster networking between patient representatives, um, academia and industry, even in basic research development and in clinical trials, etc. And that's because um, the board of directors as a whole, many of whom um, regularly interact with patient advocacy groups and know the power of having patients and patient advocacy groups directly involved even in basic research at an early stage and we'd now like to start and 
how we're going to do this is to start uh, encouraging patient advocacy groups and I encourage anyone listening to come give a talk or a poster about the disease you represent at the OTS and there will be a lot of researchers really interested. In fact, this year, um, Elizabeth Froome from World Gen Organization came gave a talk about the um, um, impact of uh, patient um, advocacy reps on, um, in this instance, it was Duchenne muscular dystrophy and clinical trials and even in basic research. And it was really an outstanding talk. And how are we gonna, and I highly recommend anyone listening um, to come to the OTS, the conference. There will be discounted registration um, for patient advocacy groups in the future. Now, with that, I'd just like to end this by uh, thanking all of the sponsors of the OTS, all the different companies that sponsor the OTS over the year, and this year in particular, and all, um, also all the academic people that are not listed here, but play a big role in um, the fantastic research that goes on uh, at the annual conference and every year, just with all the papers that are published. And also thank you all for listening. So if you have any questions, please ask. Can we target RNA or for diabetes? Can we target RNA or for diabetes? Well, uh, as I showed you in the pipeline, the Ionis are uh, targeting diabetes. And whilst I'm not entirely sure, with this is with the antisensor organucleotides. Now, whilst I'm not entirely sure the exact gene of target for the diabetes, I'd have to look it up, but for sure, if you can target something with the antisense, you could probably try and target the diabetes with the RNAi for sure. You could. Um, can t uh, more approaches to get oligonucleotides into higher levels of the cells? Ha! <laughs> well, that is uh, the big question now. Something a technology that was developed. I don't know if I have a slide for it, but. I'll show you now was some many people have tried to um, develop um, deliveries to get oligonucleotides into cells. Uh, some people try to formulate this, um, your oligonucleotide like our nylum have in these lipid nanoparticles. Um, our nylum have also developed a for a um, um, different disease. There's something called GALNAC, which essentially is um, a scaffold that uh, allows oligonucleotide, that it's N-galactosamine, um, triglyceride. It's N-acetylgalactosamine, or N-galactosamine. And they have, what they can do is they can conjugate these um, essentially like uh, galactose is sugar and they can conjugate it onto their um, siRNA or antisense oligonucleotide or whatever you want and it actually helps go into the liver and increase the uptake of the oligonucleotide by the liver by 10 to 30 times you can get an increase in the activity and all they do with that is they take their uh, let me just show you they take their uh, siRNA here and if you look at the screen they just 
um, literally add the conjugation here at the end of the oligonucleotide. And they know that the galactose can, um, galactosamine can um, um, increase, um, helps uh, go into the liver a lot. And this is, and actually this was really big breakthrough technology, the conjugations with the conjugations. And now a lot of people are trying many different conjugations to get into many different biological specific target tissues and specific cells. Uh, okay, so second, next question is about uh, the pros and cons of using PNA as a tool for targeting the mRNA. Well, PNAs um, are great because they do not have endonuclease. They are very high resistance to endonuclease. Um, they can lack some binding affinity to target. They Sometimes they don't bind to their target quite as well as you'd want them to. And another problem with working with the PNAs is that um, because they're very um, not water soluble, because they're very light in terms of lipophilic, it can be a problem just working with them as in general and trying to get them to dissolve in water. And that's part of the problem because one of the major pros of PNA is that they lack this negative, this uh, oxygen with this negative charge here. And um, that helps them get into cells better in theory, but then it creates this difficulty with working with them. And they also tend, can have lower binding to targets. So that's why I said that. Any other questions? No worries. Thank you for uh, coming. 